Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Hello and welcome to another episode of Living the Dream with Curveball. I'm your host. Curveball, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. He is none other than Taye Uhuru. He is an author, an independent hip hop artist. He has traveled to over 45 states and 60 countries and performed with musicians all over the world. So we're going to be talking to him about his credentials and what he's doing with children and everything that he's got going on. Taye, thank you so much for joining me today. Peace, King. I truly appreciate you. It's an honor. Thank you for allowing me to come on your platform. No problem. Why don't you start off by giving the audience a little bit of background about yourself because you got a lengthy bio. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I think you summed it up for the most part. You know, I'm a world traveler. I enjoy traveling around the world. I've been doing it for the last 10 years. I got my passport in 2010. And, you know, despite the pandemic, I've still been able to, you know, make my rounds around the world into different countries. It's a little bit different. You know, it's a little bit slower now, but I haven't let that stop me. Um, I've turned it into a business. So, you know, I do do tours. I take groups of Americans and take them to different countries in Africa. You know, we have tours all year round. We go to Ghana, Senegal, Cape Verde, Kenya, uh, Egypt, South Africa, you know, a few other places like that. So let's talk about how you got started doing this. You, you are not, you're also an independent hip hop artist. Tell us what made you get started in doing what you do now. Oh, OK. Yeah, I'm definitely a hip hop artist. I'm a musician. I'm an MC. Um, I've been writing rap since I was a kid, you know, maybe around sixth grade, fifth grade, middle school. You know, that's when I really started, you know, and then as I got older, 15 or 16, it got a little bit more competitive, but it was always fun, you know, rhyming words, you know, seeing people's reactions and things like that in school, banging on the tables and doing things like that. And then as an adult, I took it a little bit more serious, start writing full songs and recording songs, learning how to mix, learning how to make, you know, CDs and covers and, you know, selling my music, going on the road, going to different cities, networking with people, performing, you know, doing things like that. And then, like I said, in 2010 is when I started going outside the country. So I um, was able to do it on a global level, you know what I'm saying? Being able to work with artists in Senegal, South Africa, Brazil, Amsterdam, you know, and many other places, you know. Also, I'm an author. I just released my first book, it's called the Afro set. Um, I spent about five years reading, writing and researching, you know, this project before I released it. Well, I, I know I've been rapping for about almost 30 years. Wow, and that's amazing. Yeah, I've been writing stuff as well. So let's talk about that new book. Tell us what that new book is about. Oh, OK, the name of the book is called the Afro set. So Afro was short for African. You know, that's a term that I think Malcolm X popularized in the 1960s. So my uncle, he co-founded this group called the Afro Set. And um, it was established in the city of Cleveland. And he was the minister of information. The group, it was, um, it provided a lot of social programs and different things in the community. You know, they had breakfast programs, lunch programs. Um, they opened up a nursery. Uh, they had a lot of educational classes, you know, classes on self-defense, economics, um, health and wellness. You know, they taught African language, African history. They brought African music, taught people how to play the African drums, you know, things like that. African dancing. They also performed self-defense. They taught that. They did the military drills. They used rifles. They trained with rifles, machetes, sticks. They did hand combat. You know, they did things like that. They opened up a theater. They would do poetry readings fashion shows, musical performances, you know, they would um, do community policing, you know, if people came into the community and they sold drugs or if they were pimping or if they were snatching purses, you know, they would run them out of the community. Um, if police were brutalizing people in the neighborhood, they would confront them, 
So it's a very exciting book, a lot of history, a lot of riots, rebellions, uprisings and shootouts and different things that took place in the city of Cleveland. So nobody has ever wrote about this group in totality. So this book, you know, talks about the rise and the fall of this organization that my uncle was responsible for co-founding. Well, how did they end up falling? What happened in that situation? If you like to talk about it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, the Afro said pretty much endured the same type of things that groups like the Black Panthers, um, the US organization, the Black Liberation Army, you know what I'm saying? They, they was a part of that Cointel Pro era. So, you know, different things was done to try to make the groups fight each other. Different things was done to put people in prison for things that they didn't do. I'm talking about innocent people. And, you know, in other cases, leaders of the groups would come up missing or they would be assassinated. You know, all of those types of, of things, because it's the same time period. But the Afro set was a little bit they were similar to the Black Panthers, but they were different. They were more Afro centric. So, you know, for example, like the Black Panthers, you had Fred Hampton, Bobby Seale, Huey Newton, you know, and many others. A lot of them, you know, they pretty much kept their names. But when you joined the Afro set, they gave you an African name and they taught you Swahili. So it was a little bit more geared towards Afrocentric education and things like that. Well, speaking of African names, tell us how you got your name, Taye Uhuru. Oh, OK. Yeah. So my African name is Taye Uhuru, and it's a name that I gave myself. Taye, it's a, it's a word that they use in Ethiopia. Ethiopia, one of their languages that they speak is called Amharic. Taye, it means to see something, to have a vision. You know, so Uhuru, that's a word that they use in uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Southeastern Africa. I think it's probably the largest language spoken in Africa out of the thousands of languages, but Uhuru, it just means freedom. So my name means, Taye Uhuru means he who has seen freedom. That's a pretty good name. I like that name. Thank let's you. Talk, thank you. Let's talk about some of the biggest artists and the artists that you have performed with around the world in your hip hop career. Oh, okay. Well, I haven't really worked with any big names, people that you might know, any household names, but the biggest and brightest artists that I've always worked with have been underground artists, you know, artists that may be, you know, popular in their community or popular in their city or their neighborhood. Well, you also studied in the Dominican Republic in 2014. Tell us what you studied and about your volunteer work that you did there and what made you decide to do the work you did. Oh, OK. OK. I could talk about that. So, yeah, I, I was blessed and fortunate enough to be able to study abroad. So I lived in the Dominican Republic and I lived in Brazil. And while I was staying in these countries, I went to school. So when I went to the Dominican Republic in 2014, I was just involved in a lot of different things, you know, social activities. So. When I would go to I would go to class during the daytime and then in the afternoon, I would go to the orphanage. I would volunteer during the week. So I would go up there maybe three days a week. And then on the weekends, we would go to the community centers and volunteer. So the orphanages, it was like, you know, younger kids, smaller kids, elementary school age kids. And I would do tutoring. We would do English and Spanish. I would teach them a little bit of history. I would bring my computer computer up there because they didn't have access. You know, that's not something that's easily as accessible in the Dominican Republic. You know, so I let them play games on the computer. You know, we would donate food, we would donate money, we would donate school supplies, clothes. We would clean the orphanage up. We would help paint it, you know, make it look nice for the kids and stuff like that. And then on the weekends, we would work with like teenagers and high school kids and also some young adults. You know, some people wanted to learn English and different things like that. You know, we would have conversations and engage with them, you know, so they would have you know, people to practice with, you know, because when you study in a language, sometimes it's kind of one sided. You just reading it and you participating with other people that, you know, are learning the same language versus getting to talk to a native speaker of that language. So we was able to help the people in that way. Well, let's talk about some of the positive things that Camp Cleveland, your your community efforts and everything that you're doing to give back to the community. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I definitely love giving back to the community, the black community in particular, but I look at the community from a global perspective. So I've been able to help people all around the world. Like I mentioned, Dominican Republic, people in Haiti, the Philippines, you know, different parts of Africa and things like that. So one of my tours, my educational tours, we go to a school in Cape Verde. That's on the west side of Africa. We pretty much do some of the same things, as I mentioned, in the Dominican Republic. You know, we donate food, we donate uh, clothing, school supplies. You know, we try to work with the kids and get them the things that they need. Because in some countries, if kids don't have money, then they can't go to school. You know, it's not necessarily free or um, available to everyone. I've done a lot of things in Cleveland as well. In 2016, I co-founded a food cooperative. I was the president for the first three years. More recently, you know, I've done things as well. 2020, we had a Christmas drive. We gave away bikes and scooters and uh, skateboards and, you know, different gifts to families that may not have been able to afford gifts for their children. We've done winter, warm winter drives, giving away coats and hats and gloves. Um, I volunteered at homeless shelters. You know, we provided food and, you know, different things like that. I'm trying to think of some more things. During the pandemic, you know, I was able to help a lot of people that I know. I was able to send money to places like Cuba and the Philippines, you know, so people can get medicine or helping my friends in Ghana or helping my friends in South Africa, you know, buying them groceries, buying them supplies and different things that they may need. People in Ethiopia helping them as well. But also in Cleveland, the food cooperative was able to deliver food, hot meals, medical supplies, protective equipment. So, you know, just it's, it's a, a long list of things because this is something that I love to do, something I always do, working with people with developmental disabilities, tutoring, mentoring. You know, I try to give back any way that I can. You are listening to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast. We are talking to Taye Yuhuru, and we'll be right back after this quick commercial break. Dot to dot. A new skill every day in five minutes. So many skills to cover. Welcome to Zork. Zork is a game of adventure, danger, and low cunning. A daily podcast just isn't enough. Play Jeopardy. This is Jeopardy. And now, here is your host. Awaken Jeopardy. the Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> Open body coach. Knife straight back, knees up nice and high in three, two, one, good, and we're off. Play Himalaya sounds. Dot to dot. The podcast for everyone is dotty about Alexa. Welcome back to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast. I am joined by Taye Yuhuru, and we are talking about his life and everything that he is doing with his business to give back to the community. So Taye, if somebody wanted to help out with your efforts in the community or global efforts, how would they help out? Is that possible? Yeah, definitely. Um, People can help out in many ways. If they want to volunteer, you know, they can do that. Uh, if they want to donate supplies, if they want to donate money or clothes, you know, there's it's multiple ways they can do it. Any little bit helps, you know, ain't no donation too small. Or, you know, if they just want to volunteer one time for one day, you know, or if they can connect me with other people, you know, that helps also as well. Or if they know people in need, maybe we might be able to help them or, um, you know, connect them with somebody that can help them. Um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. I have a lot of videos and pictures and more information. If people want to contact me on social media, my page is Camp Cleveland, C-A-M-P Cleveland. Um, also, I have a website, campcleveland.org, C-A-M-P Cleveland.org. Speaking of the YouTube videos, let's talk about two in particular, The Black of the Barrier and Do Revolutionaries Go to Heaven? Tell us about those videos. Oh, okay. Um, The latest one I did was Do Revolutionaries Go to Heaven? Uh, This was a song that I wrote, I recorded, I filmed, 
um, in South Africa, in the city of Johannesburg. So I lived in South Africa. I had an apartment and I stayed in a neighborhood called Mambo Nang. And this was during the pandemic. Mambo Nang is a very unique place. I've never been to a place like this before, but a lot of artists, musicians, dancers, producers, writers, singers, photographers, directors, they live in this neighborhood. So I was blessed, although everything was locked down and shut down. I had a producer that stayed next door. I had a singer that stayed up the hall. I had, you know, a video photographer that stayed upstairs. I had a studio downstairs. So I was still in my creative mode despite, you know, the pandemic. And in this same neighborhood, you know, I would walk to the grocery store every day. So it's a very colorful and vibrant neighborhood. It's a lot of murals. You know, you see paintings of people like Marcus Garvey, Nelson Mandela, Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, you know, very strong Black people. So I was inspired by this community to write that song. So basically, the revolutionaries go to heaven. You know, I think it's something that a lot of people can relate to. We have a lot of Black people that have and continue to, you know, put their lives on the line to advance and liberate, you know, Black people all over the world. And I just wanted to recognize Can you give us a a few bars from it? Oh, yeah. Let me see. I say, dear God, I got one question. I need to know, do revolutionaries go to heaven? And if so, may their legacies last forever and their seeds grow. Tell them that we love them so and never let them die slow. It's like we cursed to be born black. We was kings and queens. Now look where we at. I know it won't be long before we take it back. I just hope I live long enough to see it happen. And it's a fact. One thing when you pro-Black, you might love your people, but they may not love you back. For more than 400 years, we've been under attack. We survived slavery, and then they gave us crack. So that's just a verse. But I think it, if if you have time, check out the video. It's a lot of powerful imagery, you know, and you'll really get the full effect of, you know, my vibe and what I was feeling and what I'm talking about in detail. And it's on YouTube. You can check it out. My YouTube page is Camp Cleveland. Yeah, y'all definitely go check that out. Tell us about any upcoming projects that you're working on, any, you know, any songs, anything that you're working on that we need to know about. Yeah, definitely. I'm always working. Well, I've completed the book. I'm promoting the book right now. I was blessed and I was able to conduct dozens of interviews with elders and uh, people in the community that were alive and active during the time of my book. So by me filming these interviews, I want to make it into a documentary just to show another side of it. Because, you know, when I'm writing the book and the pictures and the people that I'm talking about in the book, you know, they're teenagers, they're young adults, they're in their 20s. But then if you watch it, if you get a chance to see the documentary, you'll see some of these people are in their 80s and their 70s and their 60s, you know, their grandparents and great grandparents now, you know, so that's something that I plan on uh, finishing up in the next year or two. Um, definitely still writing music, still collaborating. I think I'm gonna do another mixtape. And also, I'm gonna continue to um, expand my business, like I said, with the tours to Africa, try to add more countries, you know, as the world is opening back up. I've been doing a lot of um, international e-commerce. So when I go to different countries, I buy different products, herbs, clothing, hair care, skin care products, you know, earrings, dashikis, artwork. I sell a lot of that stuff on my website. Speaking of that website, go ahead and give out your full contact information. How can people purchase your book, your website, your social media so we can follow you? Okay, okay. Um, So everything is on my website, my book, um, the products that I sell, the information about the tours to Africa, um, my music, everything is there. So you can go to campcleveland.org. And if you're on social media, you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Melanated People. I'm under Camp Cleveland, C-A-M-P Cleveland. You got any final thoughts before we get up out of here? No, I think we covered pretty much everything. I just want to thank you again. I truly appreciate you, you know, for giving me this opportunity to um, to talk about my journey on your platform. Oh, I appreciate you for coming on. And listeners, please be sure to follow, rate, review, share, tell a friend, and support CampCleveland.org after listening 
Taye, thank you so much for joining me today. All right, peace, King. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.